Thank you. Um, I'm Susan Weiss Firestone from Longmeadow, Mass, and a member of the Jewish Funders Network. And I am honored and delighted to serve on this panel with Ruth Messenger and Rabbi Maury Schwartz. Um, serious adult Jewish learning has become a passion of mine over the years. It began in the early 90s when I was privileged to be a member of the then UJA Young Leadership Cabinet. There we learned from top rabbis and scholars, including David Hartman, Yitz Greenberg, Erica Brown, Danny Gordis, and many more. It was there that I began to develop a grown-up Jewish identity and could put the why to the what that I was doing. I then became a Melton student and have continued with that as well as having learned at Hadar and the Hartman Institute. And I'm so committed to it that I've actually Full disclosure, serve as a board member on both Melton and Hadar boards. When a program such as Melton is offered in a community, people of a variety of backgrounds, knowledge, and affiliations come together in an open and non judgmental context. Sharing differences and similarities over studying a text together helps to create bonds of trust and commitment. People meet each other who maybe wouldn't have encountered each other. Otherwise, maybe they end up collaborating on a project together that they may never have considered. Another way of creating community is by deepening one's own personal commitment to Judaism through study. One person I know took Melton, and as she gained an understanding of the importance of the daily minion, took on the responsibility of strengthening the daily minion at her synagogue. In order to have a strong community, we need Jewishly literate leaders. Serious adult Jewish learning helps people to strengthen their own personal Jewish identity as well as to be able to know our story. In order to be a good leader, one must have facility with Jewish concepts and Jewish texts. Without this foundation, one cannot participate in the big Jewish conversations of the day. So for all these reasons and more, serious adult Jewish learning is important. And now I'm delighted to turn this over to my friend and colleague, Maury Schwartz, Rabbi Maury Schwartz. Thank you, Susan. And uh, thanks to all of you who've joined us here today to uh, learn a little bit about a topic that um, is something that I've been involved in for uh, almost for three or four decades now, um, the importance of Jewish adult learning. Uh, I'm going to share with you um, some uh, a PowerPoint right now, um, some slides. Um, some slides that just share with you some of the findings of a study that I did um, over the years 2016 to 2018. But I'd like to just begin by saying that I thought, or many of us think, that Jewish adult learning is an opportunity um, to give adults the opportunity to learn about things they didn't know before, to enhance perhaps or make up for learning that they hadn't ever had the privilege of, of engaging in, to make up for a bad Hebrew school or Sunday school education that they got growing up. And I think to a great extent that's the case and we're committed to doing that. But what we found um, over the now four decades at the Florence Mountain School, four decades of uh, bringing Jewish adult learning to the Jewish world is that it does a lot more. It does a lot more than just enhance the individual's journey. It's actually playing a role in changing and enhancing Jewish community. Um, the study I did was of the, uh, the Kansas City Jewish community where I uh, interviewed about 38 different uh, members of the community, men and women. Um, 33 of them are, were current or former active participants in Jewish adult learning and five other adult uh, non-learners. And what I found is that um, pluralistic adult Jewish learning strengthens social capital and it's reflected in six specific indicators. In other words, as a result of the um, interviews, certain words continued to come up and they pointed to changes in the norms in the community, trust, 
network, social agency, tolerance of diversity. But the one I want to speak about today is a sense of community that the students were experiencing. And let me share with you what I mean by that. When the students were asked uh, in a number of different ways about their experience beyond just what did you learn, but what was the experience of being part of a learning community? Um, you can see a large number of them shared with me that it was, be, it was about being part of a, of, a, of a community. I felt like the people I was learning with were an extended family, giving me the opportunity to really feel a sense of belonging. Um, one person in the class um, one, shared the following. She said, when one person in the class would let us know about something going on, a special project, a special program, we felt like we could even should go saying, this is our community. Let me go strengthen our community. In other words, what, and this echoed through many of the interviews, the sense that people's involvement in that select group on an ongoing basis made them feel more committed, not only to the group, but to the extended community in which they found themselves in the Kansas City community. Another one of the quotes that came out of the interviews, people notice when you miss a class, a phone call asking you if everything is okay. When you're with people every week for a certain amount of time, you in a way get to know them. And so when they are not there, you worry a little. The class was a group of caring people who know each other in a different way. These, um, again, many times we would hear stories, I would hear stories in the interviews, of uh, particular situations that people felt that their community had become the students they were with. And those people, even more so in cases than their synagogue communities or other communities, would be the people who would be there with them through celebrations and other life cycle events. I was looking for community, said a young person. I'm still friendly with the people from those days. And there was the whole reason that they got involved in the learning was for the sense of being part of community. I was probably not consciously seeking the community piece. One other, and this goes sort of relates to one of the comments I just made, but this, this uh, young woman said, I developed personal connections with people who are older than me, who I'd never met elsewhere. Also, I created relationships that expand because, because I also, are also members of, because of people, sorry, my screen got covered by the pictures, that expand because they are also members of my shul or they are parents in the shul. We're really a close group. Half of these people showed up at my son's bris, so we have created a community in that group. It seems to me that there's a lot that, that can be learned from the ongoing sponsorship of Jewish adult learning in our communities. Um, it's way beyond just the opportunity for people to get a Jewish adult learning education. There are implications about this um, for actually, I would say, the sponsoring agencies that are sponsoring Jewish adult learning in their communities. And here are a few of them. Uh, number one, Jewish adult learning is an excellent entree to the community for new members of the community. I've even suggested that communities consider underwriting the cost of allowing a person to study for a year, giving them almost a coupon for people who move to the community, because that's a great way to begin to integrate them into their communities. Another implication for communities would be um, that Jewish adult learning communities are, or sub-communities are places to showcase local Jewish communal institutions and raise communal awareness. Places that sponsor Jewish adult learning should already take advantage of that as an opportunity to share with those learners what's going on. Believe me, they're, they're not insulted by that. They actually find it to be an opportunity to know more of what's happening in their community. Um, I saw, saw this in my research that um, Jewish adult learning groups became a source of increased volunteerism. If somebody's in the group and they're chairing a committee, they're involved in an organization, they look to their learners, their fellow learners, as potential volunteers to be involved. On the, in the activities that they're involved in. Um, Jewish adult learning is a great tool for engendering what's called bonding, bridging, and linking social capital. Bonding social capital is, is when the group itself feels closer, closer knit. Bridging social capital is when you have an opportunity to meet people who have similar interests that you have, but you never would have otherwise met them. 
linking social capital is the opportunity to meet people that you have no similar interests and you never would have met them, but the, the learning with them together in a group affords that opportunity to link to people way outside. So as an example, um, in a community where the learning is made up of, of uh, members of the reform, conservative, and orthodox community all together, so there's opportunities to meet people that they normally wouldn't meet. And, and creating learning groups like that is an opportunity to build these bridges and these links and also to strengthen the community at large. Um, Jewish adult learning can be an incubator for tolerance, understanding, respect, and appreciation of diversity. One of the things that we learned from this uh, research was that many people had taken the skills that they learned from that experience in the um, in the classroom itself, and they brought it out to their experiences as members of committees, members of federation, board of directors, synagogue board members. People would say, like, when they would have a conversation in a uh, at a board meeting, and it got a little bit challenging. You could tell the people who had studied in a Jewish adult learning setting, uh, in particular in this case in Melton, because they had learned the skills of how to discuss in a uh, in a civil way. And that was quite a, a finding and, and I think quite a benefit of creating adult learning communities. Thank you. That's what I wanted to present for now. And, um, and what I'd like to do now is just turn things over to, uh, to Ruth Messenger. We've had the privilege of working with Ruth um, recently in the development of a, of a uh, social justice curriculum. And uh, I'm uh, really, it's really been a pleasure to work with her and we're looking forward to what she can share with us today about the import of Jewish adult, of, of, uh, of getting involved in social justice as a mechanism for building community as well. You have to unmute yourself, Ruth. Yes, I am unmuted. Thank you, Maury. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Tamar, and thank you, JFN. So I'm delighted that you're all on. I hope that you'll actually have lots of questions for us. Um, but let me pick up, and before I actually go to Maury's specific question, which is the particular link between the social justice curriculum and the formation of community, I would just say that this notion of bringing people together, and particularly bringing people together with some text and some opportunity to learn and study is always builds community. At American Jewish World Service, I've literally had this experience in the most formal way with groups of students, rabbinical students, even rabbis, that we took on, I call them journeys, to um, see our work in the developing world. But we always um, included in those journeys time every day for study and to talk together about what people were seeing. So formal study with some text, an informal study just based on what was going on. And without any question, it always created a strong sense of community. I've had that experience as well with donor um, tours and trips. And I wanna say that um, it's really important for Maury to be highlighting this issue because community is a whole piece of what people need. And they need it particularly at a time when However, you would each like to define it for yourselves. The world is a little bit chaotic. Um, people are not sure what's happening next. They're not sure exactly, most importantly, I guess from my point of view, they're not sure about exactly how to fit in. And so bringing people together with a Jewish umbrella through a Jewish institution and giving them some pertinent Jewish learning and study creates that sense of community that not only is important in itself, which Maury was talking about, but it's important for next steps. Okay, now that I know some other people who are interested in this, or who are now I know some other people who are coming together regularly, and as Susan said before, sharing other experiences, now I feel more comfortable thinking about what can I do besides the learning, in addition to the learning, to take action. And for me then, that's where the social justice curriculum comes in, it was really an honor to be asked by many schools to develop a social justice curriculum. Um, and, and in our process of doing that, we realized, I think that the hook is particularly strong here because if people be, are concerned about an issue and let's say that, they, that they're in a congregation or even let's say that they contact a congregation because they wanna know sort of what more about fill in the blank um, 
environment, immigration, um, race and racism, poverty and hunger. It's not enough, or let's say it's, it's not unimportant, so I'll say it more strongly. It's important to be given some things to do, but it's much more important and much more valuable for the Jewish community if a group comes together, if that group is given the chance to study and to learn, and then, as our sages said, the purpose of learning is to be able to take action. And so for social justice, which I think there is both a need for right now, and also a desire on the part of many of the universe of people that all of you out there in the listening to this call want to reach. Um, there's a desire on people's parts to come together and to feel not alone. And a social, a, a, commu a course, which is what Maury's study has demonstrated with really nice graphs and barcodes, a course makes that happen. And I'm only adding to it that this new course in social justice can make that happen even more so because the group comes together. They have a really formal curriculum. So to be blunt and direct, it's not just like going out for a demonstration, which is not a bad thing to do, but it's coming together first to talk about the issue, to study the problem of, let's say, hunger in your own community. And then you have a community of people that you're now feeling, I'm a part of something, and I have friends and colleagues that can act with me, so I feel that much more empowered to go and get engaged in social justice activity to know that what I'm doing is not something I'm doing alone, but something I'm doing with others. And then, of course, there's the reinforcement effect. So once you start doing that, once you're studying once a week with a group, and in addition, using some of that study time to say, okay, now what are we going to do in our community to help work on social justice? You have the community to do it with. Once you have the community to do it with, quite frankly, it becomes a Jewish thing to do, and it strengthens people's attachment to, sense of and attachment to their own Judaism. So I've had this experience, as I say, through the work of American Jewish World Service. I've had it more informally in other places that I have and do work in the Jewish community. But I think that the, the nexus and connection of study to build community, community to build uh, an action agenda and then coming back an action agenda to strengthen people's sense of community and make them more interested in in study and in developing a jewish lens for the work that they're doing is like the perfect set of connections so thank you tomorrow i'd love to get some questions Thank you so much for, for your presentations. And I am eager to hear people's questions so people can, you can look at the Q&A box at the bottom and type in your questions as we go. We have a few that have come in and we'll start there. And this is for all or any of the three um, panelists and we'd love to hear Bruce's perspective. So the first question I wanna ask is, what are the key elements of Jewish adult learning that makes it a community builder? And whoever wants to, to grab that first. Well, I think uh, Maury's really the expert here. So Maury, why don't you go first? But I do also have some things to add. Great, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very helpful question because honestly, um, not all adult learning is such a community builder. I think um, the kind of learning we're talking about is one in which the teacher um, creates an environment where the students have the ability to not only learn things they didn't know before, but to be transparent about that as well. And what happens is it's, it's a community in which people are learning from the teacher, from the text they're studying, but also from each other. And as they feel empowered to learn from each other, and to be open to that kind of learning, they realize this is the benefit of being part of a community. We're so much richer. It's not like one plus one equals two. It's like one plus one equals five. Like there's so much more to be gained here by being a part of discussing and dialoguing about issues that are so important um, to, uh, to us in the context of community. And that just begins to enrich the notion of, wow, being part of community offers us so much more than if we're just doing this on our own. Um, and, the, and the facilitator then plays an important role in helping people to see that and to take that back 
to their to outside the classroom setting to the community at large. I think so a key element is setting up a situation where people are coming regularly, not just the one offs showing up here, showing up there, but they're developing what we call a learning community of 15, 20 people coming together regularly and having the facilitator have an eye at, toward how this enriches not only your life and my life, but the community we live in and how it how it could even further enrich it. That's those are some key elements. Um, and I would only add to that that um, it goes right to the root of what it's like to learn. So once you've finished with fill in the blank Hebrew school, day school, college, graduate school, you know most learning that people really want to do ends up being learning on their own. They they read a good book or they go onto a website, and sometimes that's very rewarding. But very often it's confusing. You have questions, but the book and the website don't talk back to you. You don't know whether you're really learning what you think you're learning. And so the most simple answer to the question is the power of having this group of students. And hopefully it's a group of students that have been excited about the idea of being brought together. And it becomes a place where you can ask questions, where you can learn from each other, where whatever your learning style is, you can meet somebody else who might have a slightly different approach to the same material, and certainly will have some different opinions about the same material, but you'll be able to share with each other. And again, for me, that's particularly reinforced in the course that I'm working on right now, because the area of social justice raises lots of questions. And you want to be able to bounce them off of other people. So if you were concerned, take the issue that's very much in the news this week, if you were concerned about the environment and if you participated in maybe in one of the demonstrations last week about climate change, then your question is, what do I do next? And somebody will give you this activity or push, push this button on your computer or um, don't use styrofoam or whatever, but much more powerfully is to be part of a group that says, okay, we need to understand all of the issues of climate change and environmental action. And we want to know what does what do our scholars, including, not limited to, but including our Jewish scholars, have to say about this issue. How, and we want to be able to be in that setting where we can bounce our individual learnings and understandings and ideas off of each other. And I think that the reason that the research shows that community really is, is strengthened by having a learning activity is precisely that, because you're not being forced to try to do something on your own, which is a very solitary activity and an uncertain activity and an activity where you don't get enough feedback. And the structure of, a, of an organized course is entirely different and entirely the opposite and very reassuring for people as well as the fact that I think it strengthens them in their learning. Great, thank you. So another question that just came in is, I noticed that pluralism is described as a key component linked to being a potent ingredient for leveraging community building. Would you say that adult learning that is not demographically Jewishly and Jewishly diverse and are pluralistic is limited and how so? And there's a little bit of a clarification in that question. In short, how important, significant is pluralism in the model? Is the is the essence of that question? Right. We're, that's that's a really great question because, as I sort of uh, alluded to, Jewish adult learning takes different forms. Um, one of the things I spoke about in my presentation was there's different kinds of building of social capital. There's bonding social capital, bridging social capital, linking social capital. Um, I think that when you have a um, homogeneous group of learners pretty much coming from the same place, you can, um, you can have what's called, uh, I think you can succeed in creating bonding social capital, a uh, stronger tribe, so to say, like a synagogue with a group of people that come together and learn regularly, they will be more committed to that community, to that synagogue community, for sure. Um, that can, I can say, you know, Having a board of directors of a synagogue that learn, who learn regularly, not only meet regularly, will, will strengthen that community, that particular community. But if you want to strengthen the larger community, and if that's on your agenda, so then you have to break out of that a little bit. And I talked about both bridging and linking. Bridging community is like having, you know, several synagogues learning together. What they have in common is they're all committed to 
Jewish communal life, they're all involved in their synagogues, and that's a bridging social capital. Linking is when you bring in some of the unaffiliated people from the community who are outside of the community, and then you're linking your community to people um, you, that, you, that generally are not there, and that strengthens the even the broader community as well. So I think it's a matter of to what degree you want to build community, and that will be a function of the extent to which you're um, homogeneous or not. And, and the, the idea of pluralistic, and from our perspective, is that you, the dialogue is one in which people are empowered to share their perspectives, and we learn in that context how to respect the perspectives of other people as well. And that respect that comes, it generates a sense of, I belong in the community, I'm a part of this community, I'm valuable in this community, and that's that's the, that's why pluralist the pluralistic part is very important um, when you're especially thinking about bridging or linking um, social capital in terms of community building. And I would only I would only add to that, Tim Arman. I absolutely agree with that. I would add that um, if you bring a community together to study, even if you're studying ancient history, and certainly if you're studying this, if you're studying modern Judaism, modern historical issues, social justice. Um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this, but any community is by definition pluralistic in that sense. In other words, if you're talking about, if you just want the facts about the, um, um, you know, the, the um, biblical era, there's some interpretation from different commentators and you get to discuss that and someone in your group might be more attracted to one interpretation than another. But rather, once you get um, a, a more contemporary topic, there's gonna to be lots of different viewpoints, even if the structure is, as it were, not broadly pluralistic, because as Maurice said, it starts inside of, let's say, one congregation. You know, two Jews, three opinions. You will find like lots of different comments and understanding of the text that people are reading, lots of different opportunities for debate. And I would add that that strengthens you then to do what, what the, ne the next steps of bridging and linking, going out, finding other people with more different points of view. One of the things we say very clearly, for example, in the social justice courses, please don't go out and do all of this alone as if you were inventing the first ever group of Jews who had anything to do with poverty. There are other Jewish groups working on poverty. There are other congregations working on poverty. And there's probably a broad kind of interfaith community where you live that's working on issues of poverty, being in a community, taking a course together, strengthens you then to go out and build those other kinds of community that Mori was talking about. I'm sorry, I'm in a building. It's making <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, another question that came in is, what personal experience have you had with a course creating community and what were the benefits to the participants? What, um, why is Melton doing social justice right now and how does this relate to, to today's topic at hand? I know there's a few questions in one, but we can take well, it. Since I one. still have a lot of announcements here, maybe Susan, maybe you would talk about your own sense of building community for a while and then I'm happy to come back. Great, thank you. You're muted, Susan. I see. Um, well, I think I gave some examples earlier. I just think that, it, particularly in a melted environment, when you come, you have people from all different parts of the community. Some are orthodox or form conservative, non-affiliated. We had some even people who aren't Jewish who want to take the class. And so you really get people, you know, sometimes in communities, people are siloed from people from one synagogue, don't know the other, et cetera. And so just by being together, they start thinking about how they create the community of the classroom the way Maury expressed, but then they start thinking like, oh, maybe we can work on some programming together with our two synagogues or, you know, all, all kinds of things come out of it because you're encountering people who maybe in your daily orbit you don't, you don't connect with and you're connecting with them in a different way. So that, you know, we found that very powerful here in our in our community, I'm sure Maury, Maury in his slides showed that he found the same. So I feel that that's a really significant part of the learning. Now I'll turn it over to Maury yeah. or yeah, I, just, I wanted to comment that take over. Sure, thank you, Susan. On the aspect of the question about why is Melton, why did Melton decide to um, create a, a specific course on social justice? Um, 
one of the things that we've, um, again, we've been creating course materials for 40 years now. And um, one of the things that's come out of our, um, of our studies, the study, our students' involvement has been the sense of um, there's, you know, there's study and there's action. And where, where does, how does one lead to the other? And because our, we, we have no agenda in Melton of having people do something with their learning. It's really about empowering them to know more, to discuss more, and wherever that goes, that's up to them. It's always been our, our place. On the other hand, there's been a lot of people saying, but shouldn't learning lead to action? Shouldn't what we, all this stuff that we've been learning lead us to go somewhere? So we decided to venture out a little bit uh, and create a course that was actually not only empowering people, but encouraging them to take their learning and do something with it in the community at large. They're not required to, but at the same token, we're not just saying to them, hey, learn and whatever happens, happens. We're saying learning can lead to greater things. And so this is a brand new direction for us to create a course in this way. And I, and I think probably Ruth, in her opening remarks, talking about where the world is at today, it just happens to be at a time where people are looking for ways that their feelings and impact and their, their sense can have, can have an impact on the greater world around them to make their, whether it's issues of the climate or issues of politics or issues um, of, uh, of poverty or immigration issues, all those issues that are spinning around our world today. Some people feel they're just a little speck on a globe and what do I, what can I do? So this is an opportunity for them together to talk about what could I do about something that's important to me. Um, okay, and I would, this is a great discussion, so good questions. I, I wanted to add a couple of things. One is, um, I love Melton seeing a way to bring this together, because I think, of course, there are some people who are just, they love study, and there's a place in the larger canon for study for its own sake, but our rabbis actually taught that study is important because it leads to action, and what concerns me is many people who because we haven't encouraged them otherwise, have divided those activities. So they do some study, and they did some study when they were in college or graduate school. As I said, they may be the people who are naturally attracted to adult learning, so they take a course. But then when it comes to action or to wanting to do something, they don't always, and this is, I'm trying to be respectful, but they don't always know that maybe it makes sense to go and study about it. And part of what Melton is saying is, Let's look at how we might connect the two. You know, so so for example, um, let's take uh, the, one of the text teachings on poverty, which will be recited at um, at Yom Kippur, which is you know to be sure that you are um, fasting with the idea of having in mind um, feeding the the hungry and clothing the naked. Okay, but what does that mean in today's society? So it could just mean make a lot of chicken soup and go and sit on the curb and dish it out but it has all kinds of other ramifications. And one of the things that's built into the social justice course is lots of text. Here's what the rabbi said, here's what the commentators said, here's what the more contemporary sages said, but also here are what Jewish groups are doing with this learning. They're taking it and they're applying it in this way and in that way. And they're thinking about um, both direct service activities and advocacy issues and policy changes. And I think, Maury said this for me very nicely, but I think that's a piece of what people are looking for. Um, Tamari also asked a question about what personal experience people had had. So I'm going to take off my mountain hat and my um, American Jewish World Service hat and just say this has happened in my own congregation. I mean, two years ago, we set up a reading group on issues of race and racism. And not only did we, of our own, take that reading to um, think about what we might do with what we were learning, and what we've been doing has been very successful, but we also ended up creating community. So there are 15 or 18 of us in that congregation who know to keep raising those issues, to keep sharing with each other things we learn about about contemporary expressions of those issues. And so there is a really strong sense of community inside the congregation from the people who are in that study group. It's great, thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, another question is, what can you tell us about the teacher who makes the experience of adult Jewish learning into a step towards building community? There are a few different attributes or things that they should bring to the table. 
that makes it, well, them successful? Right. Yeah, that's such an important question because um, I think anyone who's involved in Jewish adult learning or the development of curriculum for Jewish adult learning knows that it, it begins and ends with the teacher, um, with the facilitator of the conversation. Um, I think that the facilitators, it's important for them to have in mind the greater cause that they're involved in when they're teaching adult learners. Um, in other words, it's not just about information, it's about transformation. And that doesn't mean specifically about the person's individual journey only, but it's also about to what extent I'm in creating an atmosphere where people feel comfortable expressing their own feelings. The facilitators or the teacher's key work, aside from being a source of knowledge, is, is creating an atmosphere where people feel like they are affirmed in their ability to, to share their own perspectives. Adults come with life experiences, and those life experiences are very helpful in making the learning relevant. So creating space for that in the classroom is, is a key element because once you get that conversation going, that's when community happens. I like to say to um, our facilitators, you know, our teachers, I like to say to our Melton teachers, you know, I, what you should become in the, in the best scenario is, is a referee. <laughs> like you should get things so excited that the people are talking so much with each other that they get to the point where you have to say, okay, everybody, time out. This is a great conversation, but there's some other texts we'd like to talk about in the class. It's not, not about listening to me talk. It's, and speak. It's about giving them a voice so that they're speaking and sharing with each other and learning how to discuss, argue, debate, and how to deal with the fact that they're not all going to see things in the same way. And let me just add to that. I mean, the, the strength of the Melton schools over whatever it is, four decades, um, is, is not only picking the teachers or asking the local community to identify who will teach, but training those teachers in just the ways that Maury was describing. The social justice curriculum, which is done, and I give a shout out to Lisa Exler, who was my fundamental curriculum writer, um, has um, an, another element, and that is we say to people, while it's not a necessary part of the course, there is an early place in the course where you, the, the group that's studying together might say, okay, he, we want to, here are two examples. We want to know about this specific issue, um, environment, um, and what we can do with it at the local, national, and global level. Or they could say, we really want to start doing work locally, but we don't know what all of the key local issues are. And we advise the, Melton, the trained Melton facilitator at that point to add an element to the class by having one hour in the fourth meeting of the class to bring in an expert chosen by the group who will then provide a lot of outside information that the teacher is not gonna have. And again, as Maury just said brilliantly, that person will not simply present and say, here are the facts and here's the action and see you all at the barricades next week. That person will present information and the teacher will then help the group to ask questions, debate, pre debate the presentation and decide if this is the information they wanted, if they need to get more information. So there's a learning process built in, but uh, just a specific point, we don't assume that the person teaching this class is going to know everything about contemporary issues of social justice. We, we give that person and her or his class or community, as we're saying here, the opportunity to learn from a contemporary expert. Great, thank you. Um, okay, another question is, where would you suggest a community start if they want to get on the road to creating a stronger community based on adult learning? And to add to that question, it was another question I'll put into two, is how can funders help with, with that with building community through adult education. And that's all learned. So if you, I'll start, but Susan, maybe, or 
maybe I'd love to hear from your perspective as well, um, as someone who's been so committed to yourself learning and, and to helping to support learning. Um, I think we all believe that the first thing we need to do is get a select group of community leaders together and give them that experience. In other words, there's, it's one thing to go advertise that you have a class and whoever comes, comes, but it's, it's also very helpful to, to create a, um, um, you know, kind of a, a, a group, a specifically selected group of people who are representative from across the community to come together for a series of, ex of learning experiences, even if it's, you know, four classes over a period of four weeks, meeting once a week, um, and to give them the taste of what it means to be engaging in this kind of learning. Um, adult, adults who've not had much edu adult education or Jewish education tend to be quite passive. Um, they come and they're used to like listening to a brilliant lecturer who's been brought in from out of town to come and give them a great, amazing, inspiring speech and then leave. And, and we all love that, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about hiring a big gun to come into your community and have some kind of brilliant presentation, but it's about bringing somebody who has the ability to do what we were talking about earlier, who can take the voices of all kinds of people in the community and orchestrate them into a beautiful harmony of conversation. So when the students leave, they feel something different, not just the inspiration of someone who spoke to them, but they feel something stirring inside themselves and the excitement of having had a conversation with people in their community that they never usually speak with. I think that's a brilliant way to get things going, to give people a taste of what that's about. And from there to build something like an ongoing opportunity for, for learning. And, and I think what funders can do is to go to their, to go in their community and say, look, we don't have any, we have Jewish adult learning. Here I see this synagogue has a class, that synagogue has a class, but we need to do something for our community. So let's try this. Who do we know who can start this and let's see where, where it goes. In, in the Kansas City community, the Federation director himself in 1994-95 said, you know, I got to do something to build community here. He, Bobby Gast, he created this experience he brought Melton to the community in that case and had in his hand selected leaders. And he said, you got to take Melton. And it became like everyone was saying, Deidre, are you taking it? Are you taking it? It was very, it was very, um, it was a big popular thing to do. And it changed the course of the community. He says four Federation presidents arose out of that, of those classes. Wow. So it's, it, it has the potential to do great things for your community. Susan, did you have more that you might, no, I think you captured it exactly right. I, I don't have anything to add to that. I, I agree. I mean, I think that's what's really, really exciting about about the power of learning. And I, as I say, I think I think really almost any listener right now on this webinar can connect to the notion that it's hard to learn things alone. And we all do some of that, sometimes of necessity. But just reading the newspaper in the morning these days, at least where I come from, can be an exhausting activity of like, how do I put this all together? How do I understand it differently? Um, you know, what is the backup and what's the information? And put, coming into a group and um, getting the idea of different perspectives and different approaches to learning itself um, and different ideas about what to do with the learning is really, really powerful. And um, the answer for our funders, and I really think that part of the point here is that this may not be, that is, that is organized study may not be something that you first think about when you're thinking about Jewish, building Jewish community or strengthening Jewish continuity, but it really is. And often many funders think about it in terms of school, you know, for younger kids, okay, we want to fund and improve the day school or we want to fund and improve the Hebrew school, but they don't realize, even though they, they should, or they don't know how, to do the same thing for adult learners. And we're saying that in many ways, adult learners are both um, eager for information and eager for community. And this is a way to do both of those things together. Yeah, I'd like to just add one of the, which is a big issue on the agenda these days. A lot of, a lot of adults in their <clears throat> 60s or 70s are finding themselves in a situation where they're, they didn't have a great education themselves, 
and they have grandchildren who are now being brought up Absolutely. without very much Jewish content or Jewish ability. And and these grandparents, it's it's uh, there was a big study done recently about this. They're feeling this responsibility now to be the educators of their grandchildren. And so I just want to say that because Jewish adult learning is not specifically about reaching out to 20, 30 year olds because they have young children and it's important. It's not, it's not just about that. It's about reaching out to all different generations because they all have specific needs. And, and when I say this, you know, it's not just about the, the idea of having a place to go once a week and to be with your friends, but now we're talking about community building on the level of intergenerational and so I, I'd, I'd encourage people who are involved in funding when they're thinking about supporting Jewish adult learning, they don't think about it only as adult learning in terms of the parents of young children. They think about it as the grandparents as well, because those are the people who are not only calling the shots in their communities at this point, but also they're the ones who are beginning to feel the responsibility to raise and inspire their own grandchildren. Excellent point. Thank you. Um, I'm, we're still open for a few more minutes. If people have any more questions, they can add. Um, and in the meantime, I just wanted to thank all the panelists again for joining us today and for all this important um, information that you're sharing. And just give you all a chance if you had a last um, few few ideas you wanted to share to to wrap up this this conversation today. Don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if there's if there's anything, I know a lot was shared already. Just want to wish everyone a happy and healthy new year, and try to be creative and thinking about how you can bring more adult Jewish learning to your community. Here, here. That's that's a great way to to end. Thank you. Um, so I also want to wish everybody a Shana Tova. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all the presenters for the work that you do every day to strengthen our community and to bring this learning to, to so many different people and different segments of our community that sometimes are maybe overlooked as, as Rabbi Schwartz just mentioned. And, and please, um, everybody should, on the, all participants should know, you can reach out to me if you want to be in touch with any of the presenters or if there's any way that I can help you get more information about this important topic. So thank you again and Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thanks, everyone.